Okay, so this is um, very simple. I'm going to be talking about integers um, and um, getting the right answer with integers because it seems hard enough. Um, so I am a, a digital design engineer uh, at Analog Devices. Um, I use Julia almost every day. I don't do anything particularly fancy with it, but I'm using it for digital design and uh, modeling, uh, mostly like fixed point arithmetic, um, some like floating point approximations. But you know, I'm modeling things which ultimately become hardware. Oops. Um, Analog Devices is a, is a hardware chip company for the most part, um, doing um, analog digital conversion signal processing. And just um, coincidentally, it was uh, founded in 1965 by Ray Stater. It's the same Ray Stater as na the name of this building. Um, so in summary, what I'm going to talk about is a very simple library to solve a very simple problem, um, which is basically determining the range of values that an integer variable can, t can have. Um, and it's a simple example of um, using um, generated functions and using type parameters, which are not types, they're just numbers. And the code is up there on um, GitHub. Um, so to start with a very quick demo, um, I call these things BNs, like bounded integers. Um, so th in this case, this is to describe a bounded integer between, which you can take on any value between minus four and 23, as I just chose them randomly, which happens to have you know, the value five. So this is replacing x equals five, um, but with bounds. Um, it extrapolates and works out what, what, vary, what type you need to store. So this is an int 64. Um, I have a 64-bit machine. Um, so x is a number um, held in a 64-bit um, space. Um, y is another number, which happens to be um, value six, but it could be from between four and nine. Um, I add these two numbers, and I add five and six, I get 11, but um, it could have a range of zero to 32. So you get the idea. Um, the ranges are checked when you construct the number from an integer. So you can build a, a number which is zero and 10 with the value three, that's perfectly fine. You try and make the number 30 into a number between zero and 10, you get an error. Um, that's kind of what you'd expect. And um, you know, the code to do this is fairly efficient. Um, you know, I love this aspect of it. You can just look at the LLVM code. But you know, um, most of the time, you don't need to do these checks. And it's kind of nice not to have to do them um, to get this extra efficiency. Um, so my main motivation for why I'm interested in the bounds and numbers is, like, um, is related to, to this like, um, machine arithmetic. Um, wraps around. Um, if you take like one shifted up by 62, you get a pretty big number. If you shift it up by 63, you'd expect a bigger number, but you don't. Um, you, you wrapped around module two to the n, n being 63, 64 in this case. Um, you add two large numbers, I get the same <laughs> wrong answer. And um, you can fix this by you know using int 128 so, or big ints. Um, but um, you know, this same problem um, arises in, in the design of hardware. And um, um, you know, my, my motivation is to, to track the model digital systems and I know the ranges so I can answer questions like, you know, do I need 10 bits or 11 bits? How many bits do I need to represent this, this, um, this signal? Um, and, to, to ultimately to avoid wraparound. Wraparound is often, most often, not what you want. I'd say in both software and hardware. You most often want to get the right answer. Um, so, you know, these bints or bints, whatever, um, just work. If I take a number between zero and 10, which happens to have the value five, I shift it up by, by some range of, um, in this case, zero to 127, so a seven bit number. So this would be a shoot shifter. So five shifted up by six is you know, a relatively small number, 320, but um, it potentially could be a huge number because it could be shifted up. It could be the number 10 shifted up by 127. Um, and the problem why we've got all this stuff there is um, type parameters have to be a, a bits type. I can't have like a, a big int 
instance in there. So what I've done is I've just, um, when I detect, I've, I need to represent a number which is too large um, for init 128. I just um, turn it into a tuple base, um, one, or base 1000. And you can sort of see the, the, the correspondence there between you know, the, 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 big, the big int value and the tuple, which has been encoded as a type parameter. So that's just a bit of a hack to get around uh, you know, like, uh, an issue. So basically, I can encode arbitrary large constants in the type, which is like all I want to do. And I don't care about the speed, because this is being done like once at um, kind of compile time. Um, so you know, this is absolutely fine as far as I'm concerned. This is great. It doesn't overflow. It doesn't do anything bad. And then um, the, the second argument in, in my um, you know type parameters is just the, the, the data, data type used to represent the number, the, the value. So big int is fine for that. Um, so they're efficient. Uh, if I take the number um, four and the number five, both within the range of zero to ten, and add them. I get the number nine with a range of zero to 20. If I look at the code behind that, you know, it's basically, you know, like load the numbers um, and do a 64-bit add. There's no, um, there's no checking um, for bounds or anything um, because I've done that at compile time outside of, um, you know, you, you don't see it. That's a, like a, a compile time check. Um, adding two 64-bit numbers, which would give a 65-bit number, um, this is a little bit of a shortcut um, to describe the range of, um, it's, it's basically the range of a 64-bit number from type min 60, int 64 to type max int 64. Um, I add two of these together and you know, potentially the number can be um, a 65-bit number as it needs to be a one, uh, in Julia uh, of int 128. Um, and you know, this deals with that um, just fine. And you know, we look, okay, I took it. And then the, the code to, to implement this is just exploiting generated functions. Um, so this is the code um, for the addition function, taking two, um, two arguments with range 1, R1, and the range R2. I get the bounds, um, the range bounds. They come in to me as, as big ints because I want no chance of any um, overflow errors. Um, I add them together, um, make a new range out of that work out what the default storage type corresponding to that range should be. This is all done once at compile time. And then I return the um, quoted thing there um, underneath, uh, which you know, does the conversion to, to the, um, the, the output type, um, which is usually a no-op. You know, usually things aren't overflowing. Um, and it just does the addition. Um, so, you know, this is sounding pretty good. This is safe. It never overflows, assuming I've implemented it correctly. And, uh, you know, it's efficient. You know, there's no runtime. Um, you know, once you're in this number system, there's no runtime checks. It seems pretty good. Um, you know, is it a universal integer type? Well, not really, because you need to specify the range at some point. So it's not really unbounded at all. Um, and um, it's really easy to write non-type stable um, code with this. I'll give you the example. If you're, and this is a, the hardware example where I'm taking um, a sequence of numbers and accumulating them, some sort of accumulator or, or integrator. You can do this in hardware, you can do it in software. Um, when you do that addition, your number range is increasing. Um, if you take two 8-bit numbers, you really need a 9-bit answer. And round this loop, um, you kind of need to, for all, every time you add bits, you're going to have to at some point chop them off again. And then, you know, this is kind of the fundamental problem. And for me, I want that to be very explicit. Um, so, you know, this storage element here in software, this is a variable. Um, we want it to be type stable. Um, in hardware, it's a register um, or a memory element. And it has the same number of bits going in as it has going out. Um, so we need to add... Um, something in that loop that chops bits down. Um, and you know, in this case, I've got an 8-bit example. I add the two 8-bit numbers, I get a 9-bit answer. I need to chop it back down with some sort of function um, that does that. And there's a number of options there, um, three options. You kind of assume the number is within range and just do it and throw an exception if it's not within range. But um, 
can't do that in hardware. Hardware actually has to do something physically. You've got nine bits coming in and eight bits going out. It's, there has to be a defined mapping. Um, you can do the very simplest thing, is just, just toss the, the MSB, um, which is why we get this modulo two to the end behavior. Um, it's really cheap because there's no hardware involved. It's like fairly much the wrong answer though. Um, or you can clamp um, with the new minimum maximum values. There's a little bit of hardware there um, to do that. But you know, I want that loss of ideality to be explicit because I'm trying to model and make a representation of the system. Um, going to be running out of time here. Here's a very simple example. I throw an error um, because I basically have to make the policy decision that I don't want to be able to reduce numbers um, because I want uh, things to be explicit because of my motivation behind this. You can make things bigger, so you can arrange a plus or minus a thousand, in this case is fine. And if you want to like, sort of cheat, if you like, just convert it to an integer, you know, an unbounded integer and convert it back again. Um, and you'll have the runtime check that obviously we don't have in hardware. You can have used a modulo operator, and Julie already has this concept of um, you know, using modulo type to, to, to make a reduction. You're throwing away the MSBs, uh, just, that's a modulo operation. Um, I've done the same thing in my library. Um, and you know, we end up with, as expected, like the type we requested, an 8-bit type from a, um, yeah, from a 9-bit type. And then the third way is just to do a clamp. And there's a kind of an interesting issue here. Julia already has a clamp function. You, you specify a low value and a high value. Um, and you clamp between the two. Those are values. And I want to, to um, return those inside the, you know, the curly um, parentheses, curly brackets. Um, and you know, that's a bad thing to do. Because the return type should not be a function of the value. I mean, this is like sort of you know, not type stable. Um, you really want those values to be inside curly parentheses somewhere. The easiest way of doing that is to use the val kind of thing, or just to use the type, um, which is what I've done. So I've added um, you know, clamp to a type rather than clamp to a low high in the same way as the modulo operator. Um, here's a quick example. Um, taking a 16-bit number, clamping it to an 8-bit number, um, or in the, clamping the, the same 16-bit um, number to, to, to I guess, basically a signed 4-bit range there. Um, and in this case, it has actually clamped. It's taken 20, clamped it to 7. Um, so in summary, um, you know, this allows like, safe and efficient arithmetic um, using the machine types when it's possible, promoting to big end when necessary. It might not be universally useful because of this type stability issue. That's not a problem in my application. Um, and if you take care, it doesn't necessarily need to be a problem in any other application. But anyway, the code's out there. So um, yeah, I hope that was of some interest. So uh, I want to model hardware, and you know, like when we design hardware, we have far more flexibility. We can have eight bits, nine bits, twenty-three bits, yeah, right. yeah. and um, but, you know, those extra bits cost money, mm -hmm. um, and time, and speed, and performance, and whatever. So you can basically say, you can simulate the hardware and know that you don't need any more. Yeah, I want to know for sure, and you know, like you do need to come along and make these decisions as to what you want to do because you know, you fundamentally, you're all whenever you do an addition or multiply or whatever. You're growing bits, so you need to work out what you're doing. Um, you know, to, tr to truncate those back down to some sort of you know finite size. Mm -hmm. I just want to make that explicit and um, you know, and to model the effects because you know whether I'm truncating off the LSB end or I'm clamping or throwing away MSBs, that needs to be explicit and needs to be modelled. Because you know the cost of getting it wrong is immense. You know, it's, you can't just like recompile. This has gone into silicon. It's like millions of dollars and, and months of time. So it's kind of important. I don't think this would be useful for hardware modeling. I have, I have another use case in mind. But do you see any uh, particular difficulty in, in opening up the possibility of half bounded intervals? You know, never, never below negative 10, but can go infinitely large. 
And I guess so. I don't see why you couldn't do that. I don't, I'm not really seeing the application, but. Preparing for, for proof solving, essentially. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it would just be a, a little bit of additional logic as far as you know how to handle Yeah. But would you want that done at, at compile time? I don't, I don't know. Exactly. Right, okay. Yeah? So, if I understand the advantage of using, putting this into the type tree is, is to avoid the runtime checking, but of course the compile time checking is much slower if you only have a few of these. So it's basically the application that you have thousands or hundreds of thousands of yeah. Yeah, so we define the hardware once and then we would run like sort of you know millions of numbers through. And and you basically end up making the same additions and subtractions yep. repeatedly. Yep. Okay. Yep. You you definitely don't want to be I mean that that was the whole point about that accumulator, the type unstable loop, is that if you just naively do that, you've made it a lot worse because you're compiling and you're doing dynamic dispatch every time. Yeah? See, I, I, so the hardware is, is static. It's, you know, the hardware I'm modeling is static, it's fixed. You know, there's only so many like, operations that you're doing. So I don't really see it as being a problem. I mean, there's only, you know, there's only a few hundred of these things. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, so, so a lot of people did this could say, do exactly that. They count the number of bits. They say to add two 8-bit numbers, you get a 9-bit number. But you know, that kind of breaks down fairly quickly because you add four 8-bit numbers, you, you end up like, gaining an extra bit unless you put parentheses around the right way and do it as a tree. And it's just this, this way, I think, is, it gets you a tighter bound without, you know, it's just simpler. Yeah? Yep. Right. So the inherently for the problem you're working you're simulating is a fixed amount of code gen that can happen. Exactly. And you're sort of just in time materializing virtual hardware. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep, that's exactly it. So really when you use an FPGA and try to take your right, exactly. just it's <laughs> kind of where I'm going. <laughs> that's kind of that, you know. Or it might be like a real chip rather than an FPGA, but yeah. Yeah, ultimately. Thank you.